Welcome to a weekly review of North Dakota's legislative news. Now, here's your host, Dave Thompson, with North Dakota Legislative Review. Hello, I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for tuning in to Legislative Review. A couple of interesting things happened in the legislature this week. In the Senate, the Senate voted very narrowly to make not wearing your seatbelt a primary enforcement bill. It initially failed on a 23-23 tie, but one of the sponsors was not present for the vote. They brought it back the next day. It passed it 24-23. So that this means you can be pulled over simply for not wearing your safety belt. We also have a bill about sexual orientation, gender identity. It was in a Senate committee. It did get a do not pass, but there's still some work to be done on that. There is also a companion bill in the House that is going to be voted on soon. And also there are bills that are pending to raise the state gas tax by seven cents a gallon. There are also bills to increase driver's license fees. Those are monies that go to repair highways in North Dakota. Lawmakers have proposed a way to help working parents struggle with childcare costs. For it to work, companies would need to help pay for employees' childcare expenses. But supporters say the businesses would also benefit. Political correspondent Chad Mira has more. See what they do. Allison Shawcraft is hard at work taking care of her son, yeah. Noah. A very energetic, normal three-year-old. A three-year-old with a second gear. Probably the best part of my day. Woo! The best part of a long day. I work as a graphic designer at a sign company. She works full-time in a career she enjoys, but a few years ago, she had to put that career on hold. I ended up having to resign, basically, because I couldn't find any other daycare, I couldn't afford daycare. Childcare access is a big workforce issue. Senator Aaron Oban. Families want access to quality childcare for their children so that they can be at work. Statistics show it is a workforce issue. A study from Harvard published last year says 32% of employees who were considered caregivers left a job because of childcare issues. Employees like Shawcraft, who switched companies and dropped to part-time. For that whole year, I wasn't doing what I went to school for and what I initially wanted to uh, do with the, re my, the rest of my life. So Senator Oban co-sponsored a bill that would give tax credits to companies that reimburse employees for child care costs. She said it helps the parents, but also the companies attract or retain good employees. Rick Clayberg with the North Dakota Bankers Association testified in support of the bill. If you go to a community looking for a job, you find an opportunity, but if you see that child care is not available, uh, it, you just may not give that community a second look. For Childcraft, a benefit like that would mean a lot. Not only, you know, money-wise, but it would just really help out just knowing that they're understanding of being a parent. And all the work that goes with it. And joining us now is the new House Majority Leader, Representative Chet Pollard from Carrington. Thank you for being here. Hi, David. I just have to ask you the question, why did you want to become the Majority Leader? You know, I've been uh, a legislator since I got elected first in 1998 and kind of worked wa my way through the policy committees, ended up on appropriations, and, you know, all of us want to be in involved, and I've always had an interest in, in public service, and I thought, okay, as I got older, I thought I had the experience, and I thought I would uh, throw my hat in the ring against three of us, and I'm the one that ended up being the majority leader, so yeah. Is the job what you expected it to be? I'd say it's a lot busier. Uh, the, my phone rings a lot more often. I have a lot of people that want to spend time visiting with me. Uh, you know, and we, it's all about budgets. It's all about bills, which certain people want. And then I'll have people come in, citizens come in, and want to talk about particular issues, very wide ranging. You know. As a leader, then, you've, you've got a lot of responsibility. You have to, as they say, make sure the trains run on time, perhaps. Well, you know, I think that's part of, of, of one of the functions uh, of the majority leader is to have things roll. You know, uh, uh, on the House floor, the, the speaker is running how the details all work out, but uh, the assistant majority leader, Scott Lauser, and myself were making sure if there's bills re referred or if there's motions on the floor and if there's cer certain things co uh, coming up, you know, uh, it, it's a little different. Legislators are all busy. It, it, it's a very busy time when you try to fit this stuff in into 75 or, or 80 days. Hopefully it'll be 72 to, to, to 75. So the legislators are busy. And now with this, it's, it's a different role for me. 
and now I've got a couple staff and I have to have a schedule and, and people will line up for appointments. So it's different than what I'd done before, but I'm enjoying it. Well, that's good to know you're enjoying it. Uh, you, you've been on appropriations for a couple of sessions. You chaired one of the three subcommittees of appropriations. Uh, is this harder? Yes. <laughs> Harder and, and busier. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it's different because I, I chaired the HR, the human resources section of House Appropriations for six sessions, and then I, w I was a vice chair the time before that, and then I spent three sessions in the Human Services A Committee, and then time in the B Committees of the House Ag and the House Transportation. So it's just one of those things that evolved. And there you're listening to budgets, you're listening to bills, they're all dealing w with money, but they all got subject matter that are important, whether it's like the Ann Carlson Center in Jamestown or dealing with nursing homes and the DHS budget or, or the developmentally disabled. We spent a lot of time, you know, I dealt w with the health department, health, uh, the Department of Cor Corrections, part of when the state penitentiary went through their big remodel, you know, and so now I'm here doing this. And now I'm not hearing those, but what I'm hearing is we've got to make sure our revenue full forecast match with what our spending is going to be so we can have a balanced budget. And like I said before, I have a lot of folks come in and want to talk. We're a big energy state. We're also a big ag state, and I'm an ag person by trade. And, and so it's uh, just have a lot of people stopping by and want to visit. My schedule's full. You know, one of the things that you, one of the big issues that you have in the house is this Prairie Dog Bill, Operation Prairie Dog, to create a permanent infrastructure fund. Uh, House got it first, you're, you're not, it's not out of committee yet. Where are you at? As far as how the bill is, is coming, Dave, you mean? Yeah. Do you okay, well, you know, it, it was heard in House Finance and Taxation. Uh, Representative Craig Hedlund is the chair of that committee, so they heard the bill, and, and there is, I think it was almost a full day at, or two-thirds of a day of, of hearing and testimony. And a lot of the political subdivisions come in from the counties, the, the cities, the, the townships. I think there's money in there for airports. So now uh, we ourselves, myself and Chairman Jeff Dalzer of, of House of Appropriations are, are meeting with the chairman of the finance, Representative Hedlund, and the vice chairman, Representative Greinike, and we're visiting with Representative Nathy and Representative Porter, who are co-sponsors of the bill with Senator Rich, Rich Wardner. So on the House side, we have to get that out of the policy committee by February 4th, and so we're talking, okay, what do we like in the bill? What don't we like in the bill? What are our concerns? And of course, one of our major concerns is the amount of dollars, you know. You think it's, it might be too expensive for the, for the time being right now? Or? I wouldn't say that. It, it's more how it fits into the, the uh, um, whole picture. Uh, for the next few biennials because, as you mentioned, it's trying to make it permanent. You know, I got some concerns about that. Uh, we have to make sure it, it cash flows, you know, back when the bill was uh, originally discussed back in June and July when those thoughts were coming up for them crafting the bill. You know, WTI oil was around $65, $68. And now WTI is around 53, meaning that the North Dakota average price is somewhere around 43 to 45. And so those revenues have dropped drastically, which means all those buckets change. And those dollars are, are going to be coming out of certain buckets. We've got to make sure we have cash for that. Now, when the bill was introduced, it did not have a sunset clause on it. It's supposed to be a permanent fund. I have been hearing some back-channel talk that there might be more support for the bill if there were a two-year sunset on it. Where do you come down on that? You know, I, I haven't heard any it, uh, talk about a two-year sunset because the, those buckets are, are going to take a while to fill. Uh, there, there has been discussions whether there should be, but there's no amendments coming on that yet. You know, it, it's more the discussions, are the dollar amounts right? Uh, you know, should the 50 million be going to the airports like they're, they're talking about? You know, I think it's 115 million to the counties, 115 million to the cities. I better back that up. And then there's 15 million for a township. So one of those things, counties that, that get like 100 million and there's money and it's got to come out at certain times, but those buckets have to fill. So those discussions are ongoing. And like I said, to make something permanent, 
as just like with, with the social service budget takeover, when the state takes over that, that is permanent and that's permanent tax re relief so the mill levies drop. You know, so we have to make sure we can fund all that because how long ago was it? Six or eight year, years ago, we took over a greater share of K through 12. So now we've done that for the political subdivisions and, and now we're doing this. We've got to make sure it all flows and make sure we're still doing the job for the state, whether it's the state DOT or whether it's all our other, the Department of Human Services, we have to make sure we're funding all those priorities that the state has. Nice segue into my next uh, line of questioning. It has to do with social services and the idea of this redesigning social services into 16 or 17 regions. And I believe in your district, three or four counties got together and already did some kind of combination of services? You know, um, I'm from Carrington and that's in Foster County and my business is in New Rockford and that's in Eddy County and the neighboring it is uh, over in Pheasant, which is Wells County. And I don't remember the name first, I better not say the name, I don't remember for sure, but they did consolidate. And that was the idea be behind the social service um, uh, for the takeover, if the state was gonna do that, that if we're gonna be, those employees are all part of that, but they wanna be funded on the local level, then we were saying, okay, there's gotta be some efficiencies of scales, and that's why you've seen these consolidations go uh, going forward. Now, what I understand is the Foster Ed Eddie Wells consolidation, you know, is just starting out, it's in its infancy, but it sounds like it's doing well, you know? And that's the idea be behind, if the state's gonna take it over, there's gotta be some efficiencies of scale. So maybe zones might be a good idea, or at least worth Oh, I think at. they are, yes, very much so. Since we're on su subject of social services, uh, nursing homes have been saying, hey, during the cuts, we took, it, we took a pretty big hit. The governor's budget was talking about a 1% increase plus a 1% increase second in the biennium. Nursing home wants three and three. How do you feel about that? You know, let me back up a little bit. Of course, two years ago in the 65th session, uh, there were no inflators given. You know, it, it didn't, you know, the, the state employees didn't get a pay raise. The uh, uh, higher education or, and K through 12, we kept K through 12 whole as far as the student payments. And so with the Department of Human Services, all those inflators went at zero and zero. Now for the long-term care uh, for the nursing homes, we actually did something with the operating margin to help them out a little bit and that brought in a couple million dollars. And so they got a little bump when everybody else didn't. But yes, there is some red out there. I think mainly with the rural nursing homes, they're having to go into their reserves and some of those folks are seeing some red ink. And so the governor's budget has a one in one in it. Um, it's on the Senate side. The human services budget is on the Senate side. And I know they're going through that now. I don't know what they're gonna bring forward. You know, it'll be a two and two or a three and three until we see what, what the Senate does. Uh, we'll have to see what happens there first and then take it from there. You also mentioned state employees and there seems to be bipartisan agreement that state employees need a raise. And there are proposals from a one and one to a two and two, a two and four. Where do you come down? You know, again, we're discussing that, trying to, uh, uh, myself and Chairman Jeff Delzer has met with Senator Wardner and Senator Holmberg, and we're trying to come up with, with something we can talk about. You know, I haven't heard much discussion on a one and one. I, I don't see that out there. You know, there's been discussions of two and two and three and three. You know, the governor's got a package, but dealing, if I'm correct, that 1% would have to go. And I think is that a four and two, I might have that wrong. You know, so there's a number of scenarios. And so we're discussing those to see how those all come down into the package. Cause we're not talking no total bill here of five or $10 million. We're talking, you know, a two and two general fund wise is darn close to $30 million. So we're trying to come out with a package that we think is fair. And, and also dealing with the uh, um, health benefits, you know, and, and the health insurance. Uh, that is up drastically again. And so we have to decide, do we stay on the same plan? I think the governor has got uh, uh, three proposals for insurance. So those decisions are being discussed right now and nothing specifically yet, but that will be done shortly. 
since we talked about the governor's budget, there is one thing I, I, I'm curious how, how what you're hearing about the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Library and Museum proposed for Medora. He's taking he would like to take money, fifty million dollars out of the earnings of the legacy fund. There's already some murmuring pushback. Well, I'll put it that way, because I've heard legislators say I'll, I'll allow that that might be a step too far. Hmm. What I will say, Dave, it's been discussed a lot. You know, the uh, um, um, family, the Waltons were in town be because they have um, a direct relationship. Uh, Melanie has a direct relationship with the folks out in the western part of the state, and so they were here and, 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 and pitching for the, the uh, Teddy Roosevelt Library. Governor burgum has been uh, putting on a lot of educational meetings for, for folks, you know, and uh, if I'm correct, it's in part of the Commerce Department budget, and they've heard that. Um, we have a lot of folks back home. North Dakota is a, is a conservative state when, when it comes to spending, so it is a challenge. Now, how we come up with that and, and what dollars we're, we're going to do, that has to be set yet. And so, again, we just started this process, what, two and a half weeks ago? <laughs> and, and we're in it, you know, big time. And so how all those dollars fit? Because, like I said, the drop in the revenues makes a big difference on how we uh, fund all of our priorities. You know, so it we have to see how that is. It also comes down to revenue, and mm -hmm. it, it kind of resembles a big jigsaw puzzle, perhaps, to make sure all the pieces fit, to see what you can fund, what you might have to delay, what you can't fund, and some of these projects might go to this, might go off the side, but you don't know at this point. Not right now. You know, the House and the Senate may have different priorities, what, what they want to do. And so right now, I would say, like I said before, the human service budget is on the Senate side, on the House side is corrections, on the Senate side is the PERS, you know, on the Senate side, on the House side is the higher education budget, you know, so, so there's everything on each side, so we're doing our work, and of course, that crossover, it'll flip over, and then everybody will see what the priority is. You know, we, we did the legislative forecast, and, and we had the folks from oil and gas come in because, you know, oil is a huge part of our revenue projections, and, and so at that time, you know, the, the last two months, oil's been down, and so... We're very cognizant when the uh, folks from, from Moody's came in and the folks from uh, IHS come in, they had similar but different forecasts. And so we kind of did a middle of, of the stream and figured oil at 42 and a half, which is a mix between Flint Hills and West Texas intermediate. And then uh, we have the uh, uh, production at 1.35 million, you know, so that's around $4 billion, but then you, We've got all these political subdivisions that get a portion of that, and then some of that goes in, into the resources trust fund, which depends on the, all, all the water, you know. So there's a lot of priorities. What's important for Fargo Coast would probably be the FM di diversion. We also know that we got to start thinking of getting water to the Red River Valley, you know, so those discussions are going on. You know, you, you can look at, at uh, Western North Dakota. They want to make sure they have their, their, their road money. We have to make sure we have gas line production going on. So uh, the wants and needs, which are similar but different, are more than what we have right now. And we have to make sure we have that balancing act for that. So there will be priorities set. Some things on the House side will be more important than on the Senate side, but somewhere around the 70th or 75th day, we're gonna have that figured out. Very quick answer. Are you going to be able to keep some days in reserve if you need them? That's my intention. Okay. Yeah, and I've talked to Senator Wardner as well. And Senator Wardner feels the same way as well. And basically, the whole House and Senate feel that way, too. Okay. Thank you very much. Our guest today is the new House Majority Leader, Chet Pollard. He's from Carrington, North Dakota. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people who are 15 to 24. And North Dakota's suicide rate has been steadily increasing. Our political correspondent, Chad Mira, talked with Senate Minority Leader, Senator Joan Heckerman earlier this week about a bill that would require students to learn more about suicide prevention. 
this legislative session, we've already heard a lot about school safety and specifically behavioral health, and it's a topic that will certainly be discussed throughout the upcoming weeks. I'm joined now by Senate Minority Leader Senator Joan Heckman. Senator Heckman, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. You guys have a bill focused on behavioral health as well as teen suicide. Tell us what's in this bill that could help keep our students safe in the future. Sure. This is a student-driven uh, bill um, that came to my attention. Um, right now what we uh, have is we have instruction and uh, professional development opportunities in our schools for teachers, staff, administrators, but we don't specify anything in code um, for students. And the student that brought this bill forward did a great job of presenting and laid her story out for all of us to hear. Her concern is that students in schools do not have a required number of hours or minutes, um, that they can learn about suicide, uh, about signs of it, um, where to go for help, uh, and those kinds of things. So the bill basically does a few things. Uh, first of all, it would require three hours of instruction per semester, and that could be uh, for grades 7 through 12, and that could be a variety of uh, instructional methods, uh, whether it's uh, direct instruction, whether it's watching a video, whether it's interacting with a counselor. Um, it requires all schools to have a counselor, and we already do that, so the student wasn't quite aware of that situation, but we're, it's um, something that we have in the bill. And then it would also require every school to identify a first responder. In other words, someone that students can go to if they're having a bad day, feeling suicidal, or having under feelings that they don't quite understand. Um, so looking at the, the main part of the bill is the three hours per semester of um, suicide awareness. We already do a few things for our schools across the state of North Dakota, but I think that this would be a step in the right direction of making sure that um, what we have is for the students. So. How important is it? Uh, to be able to kind of spot some warning signs if we can see our own peers and, and know that maybe they need help. How key is that to helping people in need? I think that that's one of the reasons that the student brought this forward is because um, in her past and in her life so far, nobody's been available to help her with those signs that she had. Um, and the other issue that we talked about when she presented in committee is that in a rural area, um, her closest services were an hour away from her home and her school. So it meant time off of school for her to get those kinds of services. So we have to do uh, a better job in North Dakota of providing behavioral health services to our students in school. And it's really interesting a student has been helping you uh, come up with this bill, generate these ideas. What kind of impact does that have on you as a lawmaker when someone so young comes to you with an idea like this? Well, it was, it was very um, traumatic for um, the committee to hear her testimony because it is very uh, devastating for her to hear what's happened in her life and we haven't been there responding. So I think it's a wake-up call for us that we're not doing our job here in the state of North Dakota as legislators in providing those services out there to our students. So hopefully that this can be meshed into some other uh, initiatives that are currently um, in the House and the Senate and we have one broad uh, encompassing umbrella for those students and for the safety of uh, for theirs. But I think one of the bigger things is, is to know that we are not um, having services close to any of our students in the rural areas. They have to travel for those and that's, that's troublesome for me too. We should be able to have somebody in the school connected um, and um, that may be a job for our rural education associations to look at because they were developed to provide services for low incident populations in our districts and this may just be a perfect fit for our rural education associations to provide some support. Okay, Senator Heckman, thanks for your time. Thank you. Dave. Well, Chad Mira joins me on set now and Chad, what are you looking at this upcoming week or two? Well, let's start with in, in talking about uh, raises for state employees. I know it's something you just discussed with Representative Pollard. Uh, you know, the good news for state employees, it seems like a lot of people agree they should get a raise this biennium. However, we have seen already at least a few different proposals. The governor came out with his budget proposal initially saying there should be a, a 4% increase the first year and then another 2 to 4% the year after that. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party both have their own proposals as well. The Democrats want to give initially a, a, about $300 per month for that first year and then uh, another raise the year after that as well. So we'll have to see where it all falls, you know, how, how the, all the sides can come to agreement because like Representative Pollard said earlier, it, we're talking a lot of money here. And sources are telling me that we could see a floor vote on one of the bills about sexual orientation discrimination. That's probably coming up 
perhaps as early as Wednesday. That's one to take a look at too. Yeah, that's a really interesting one because it, it had a committee hearing this past week and, and got a do not pass recommendation. This is a bill that would prohibit discrimination against sexual orientation as well as gender identity. However, the lawmakers have already said, we're gonna look at this bill, we're going to make some changes and we're gonna consider it again. So it is definitely going to come up and like you said, we're expecting that to happen this upcoming week. And here's one thing that I'm kind of looking at as actually coming up in two weeks, there will be a hearing on Senator Wardner's bill to actually do some bonding for, that hasn't happened for a while since the state's been awash in oil money. There, he's going to suggest bonding for a few buildings on campuses. Very interesting. Uh, school funding is gonna be a, a big hot button issue. A lot of studies going on, so even Minot State looking at privatizing Minot State, uh, how that would impact the state. So we'll see how that happens. To how, the, how that shawl shakes out. That is going to be an interesting discussion when that gets to the floor, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. And then one other thing that I think should be coming out fairly soon will be how IT consolidation is going to go. You know, all IT departments mm -hmm. being consolidated. Yes, that'll be one to watch for sure. Oh, there's a lot, there's a lot to go on and a lot we'll be keeping our eyes on. We will. Thank you for joining us for Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson.